All right, all right. So, uh, so this is what I'd like to talk about. I'd like to talk about writing a code for science and data. Uh, there is a bit of writing code for science, but there is a bit of writing code for data science because I'd like to claim that uh, these are mostly the same thing. You just get some code and discover stuff, right? Okay. So, I, I suspect we've got a pretty diverse audience. So, I, I mean, I, I, we probably have core developers, we probably have sysadmins. Do we have any data scientists? Yay, data scientists. So all the rest are developers, right? Yeah? All right, so I guess, I guess you guys all know very well how to write code, so probably I should step down. Uh, maybe there are a few things that, that, that we can learn from, from how we work. So I am a... I qualify as a scientist, I guess, uh, which probably means I have nothing to do here. But I've been an active member of the, the SciPy ecosystem since a long time, since before it was cool. Now, I've, I, you know, I've seen many things happen. Uh, and, and so I started doing quantum physics. But these days, just to give you a bit of background, I'm interested in what's known as uh, cognitive neuroscience. So what cognitive neuroscience does is it tries to link psychology to neuroscience. And by neuroscience, we mean, we mean uh, neural implementation. And so, so the, 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 the big picture is to try to link neural activity to thoughts and cognition. So this is, this is where I sit these days. But because I'm also a computer scientist, I, of course, use computer science to do this. And so what, what we do in the lab, this is just to get you an idea of where, where I come from, but what we do in the lab is we try to learn bilateral links between brain activity that we capture with brain imaging and some description of cognitive function, which is, of course, something a bit imprecise. And so one thing that we can do, for instance, is to try to predict brain activity from the stimuli. And suppose you have a visual stimuli, then we can try to predict the visual brain activity. And this can be interesting to understand how uh, the brain works to recognize or understand uh, uh, images, basically the vision. It's known as uh, human vision. And the, the, the general picture of how human vision works these days is the idea that you have a set of different transformations uh, and the image that, that you see, the visual field that you see, undergoes a set of different transformations that are located in different areas of the cortex. And each time, you know, there are different properties that are um, um, uh, studied. Uh, so, because I'm a computer scientist, I want to study this with, uh, with data and, and math. Uh, and so one thing that we can do is that we can take uh, an experiment where the subject is uh, seeing um, uh, images and then we can look at what aspects of uh, the image predict well the neural activity in different parts of the cortex, right? So if I can find what aspects of the image predict the different parts of the cortex, I will understand better the spatial organization of the visual cortex. And you can do things like, uh, you actually, in the, in the primary visual cortex uh, here, there is what we called um, a retinotopic organization, which means that basically there is some kind of a map of the visual field that is reflected in the spatial organization of the, of the visual cortex. Now, if you want to understand this, this success, these, this chain of transformation uh, so one thing that we did that worked really well is that we used tools from uh, machine vision, so uh, computer vision. So computer vision is how computers recognize images. So basically computers stealing our jobs, which is what, what we work uh, on here, right? We work on making computers that steal the jobs of other people. So, um, so computers have gotten really good at recognizing images, right? And the, I guess the state-of-the-art tool to do this is what's known as a, a convolutional neural network. And what this is, is really a chain of transformations, one after the other, that are tuned to the data in a specific way. Okay? So what we've done is we've taken a convolutional neural net, and then we've tried to look at the internal parameters of the convolutional neural net, and to see if they explained well uh, the um, um, data um, in the, the visual uh, field, the visual system, brain activity, right? So what we've seen is we've we've shown 
that uh, artificial neural nets, convolutional neural nets, actually from a, a high level perspective match pretty well the organization of the uh, uh, visual uh, system. That's one thing we've shown. I thought it might be fun uh, for you. And another thing that we sometimes do is, well, often do, is the converse, is that we look at brain activity and we try to come to conclusion on the stimuli. So the media love this because we can say it's brain reading and there's a lot of hype. Uh, but now when you look at this, really there's lots of moving parts in this, you know, and lots of software moving parts. I need to do machine learning. So I'll talk a bit about what machine learning is if you don't know, but it's basically prediction. I need to do IO, input output, all the time. I need to do reporting. I need to do job management. I need to be able to audit all this, to understand what's going on, to have other people working with me. What saves me and what's been saving me for 15 years is that there's this thing that's called Python. Maybe you heard about it, and it's really cool. And it's got a lot of different libraries, the whole SciPy stack and, and Scikit-learn that we created and that grew much bigger than us. And MyLearn, which is something about neuroimaging that we created and didn't grow much bigger than us. So, so this is a lot of my daily work too. So my mantra about software is we need to make it work, we need to make it right, and then we need to make it boring so that we can focus on what we want to do with it. That said, I promised I would talk about how to write code for uh, science and data. So this is uh, uh, the things I'd like to talk about. The first thing I'd like to talk about is how we in science or in data science work in a very iterative way, which is great because that's what allows us to, to push our thinking forward and also dangerous because we can create horrible mess of code. Then based on this, I'd like to talk a bit about a library design in particular for science or data science, but I think there are lots of um, messages that are wider. And then I decided that maybe I could talk a bit about machine learning in Python because I guess that's maybe something some of you are interested in, in learning about. So that's, that's, my, that's the menu for, for this morning. So iterative thinking, which is extremely important to what we do. Uh, so whether you're in, in science or, or data science, uh, the workflow really is based on developing intuition and experimentation. Uh, so really, you, you come up with conjectures, with ID about, about the data or about the science, and then you, you code a few lines and you test them, and you keep going like this. It's really, it's not at all, you know, whatever, waterfall uh, design or something where I sit down and write classes and, and suddenly science, is, science emerges. Uh, so we need our code to be interactive. Good news, Python is interactive. And we need it to be frameworkless. Uh, I ne have never seen any, any success of frameworks or, or things that are obviously frameworks in science. You can always do frameworks that are hidden. Uh, that said, we also need consolidation, else where the thing collapses, and we need to keep flexibility. So that's a challenge. And I don't know if you've heard, but there's this, this thing about reprodu reproducibility in science. And one of the problems that we face with this iterative workflow is that we can really build things that are completely reproducible. So what, what we call reproducibility is that we can do a new analysis that comes to the same conclusion. And it's really important because this is how we're going to convince others that what we've done is correct, because they can verify or falsify what we've done. It's also really relevant for data science. So suppose you're doing data science for business intelligence and you're going to uh, come up with recommendations on the strategy of the company. Uh, well, these recommendations may be questions, and rightfully, because if you're going to make you know, billion-dollar decisions, you better know what's going on. So it means that you should be able to reproduce the analysis and audit this. And I think there's a bit of this also in system administration. Have you ever had this situation where you've got the server who's been running for a while, and then the server crashes, dies, and you try to reconstruct it, and you realize that you don't know the steps that are needed to put everything back together? So. I guess everybody that has an iterative uh, workflow ends up with these problems. So if you look at the problems, uh, what are the impediments? Well, quite often, 
we find that they're missing steps or missing files. That the libraries have changed. That's a problem all the time. That the code is not portable. Works on my laptop, but not on yours. Of course, we can have numerical instabilities. And at the end of the day, quite often, nobody knows where the information is. So if you look through this, there's a, a mixture of technical problems and human problems. And I can, I can see two like general messages. One that's crucial is that code quality really matters. That's the general message whenever you, you do code. And another one that is that manual steps are evil. And I guess that loops back to, to sysadmins. I know a lot of sysadmins that try to encode every step in some, some framework or something to avoid any manual work. And so we talk a lot about reproducibility. But I think a more interesting notion is that of reusability. And the idea is, okay, I've got this, this analysis that I've done in data science or in science. Can I apply it to a new problem? And I think that's a much more interesting uh, uh, point of view. And I, you know, of course, as software developers, I think you'll probably agree with me. And I, I think there's an interesting transition that we can make from one to the other. So I guess we're, we're seeing a, a direction in which to go. <clears throat> so, you all know what the MVC design pattern is, right? Because you're developers. Just, just to, to set the picture, so it's, it's, it's a fairly classic uh, a design pattern. It's a textbook one. And the idea being that if you've got an application, you will, you will split it in a, a model that is where you put the rules of the application and, and maybe the data management. And a view, which is that what controls the output, basically, and the controller, which is how you command what's going on. And so I've seen this a lot in, in graphical user interfaces, in web design, uh, and I really thought that, uh, well, science doesn't need this because we don't need frameworks. And as I worked, I realized that over the years, I've started organizing my, my work in a specific way where I'm going to put my my simulation code or my hardcore numerical code in a module. And I'm going to make really careful that this module is made of functions and objects that are reusable. I'm going to output all the results that I, I, of my simulations, of my analysis, in data files and plots. And importantly, I'm often going to output them in an intermediate representation, which is a data file, and then I'm going to have a, a second step that turns this into a plot. Now, that really looks like a view to me. And finally, it's really important to have something that control what's going on. That's a controller. And what, what you find often is that people in, in scientific computing, well, historically, what they would do is that they would come with crazy configuration files that would describe what the experiment is, what the analysis is. And there's this joke that says that any major scientific computing uh, uh, project eventually ends up reinventing a subset of Lisp to describe the experiment. Well, I've got good news. We've got a nice language that's called Python and it's imperative. So my controller is basically a Python script. It's not a file that describes the experiment. And it's got, of course, pros and cons. It's harder to analyze, but it's more powerful. Okay. So as I said, I've got this recipe, which is three types of files. Modules, where there's reusable code. Command scripts that control the modules to run everything and post-processing post scripts that go from the intermediate representation to pretty pictures that I can put in my papers or show my, my boss, even though I'm my own boss these days. Uh, why is this important? If I do this well, I can put everything in version control, which for reproducibility is crucial. So version control, I, I guess I'm talking to the wrong audience. You all use it. But that's like the best invention ever, and whoever is not using it or is just shooting himself as the f in the foot. So what are my goals here? Decoupling the steps, reusing the code, and of course, mitigating compute time. So how do I work in real life? Because this is all theory. In practice, really, what, what I do is I'm in a train and I have an ID, so I start with the scripts and I start you know, playing around to try to understand things. But as I go, I know it's really important to uh, identify blocks that I can move out to a function. 
Uh, and w what you find is that people who work in an interactive way, uh, I, I find often delay this too much. And the obstacle here is, is the problem of scope. Once I've moved code into a function, I've lost access to the internal variables of the function, right? Uh, so it's a good thing because it requires identifying input and output, uh, which, which makes the thing more reusable. But it also makes it harder to get an intuition of what's going on. Well, there's a solution for this. It's called a debugger. And scientists, at least, don't use the debugger enough to get an understanding of what's going on. I think it's, it's crucial. So we work, as, as I said, we work a lot in the interactive ways. So we work with this thing that's called IPython or, or Jupyter, which is an interactive uh, environment. And it actually has a debugger. It's basic, but it works really well. Uh, so for me, I think that functions are the basic reusable abstraction. Uh, they're really the crucial thing. We can, we can have more complex things with objects, but objects tend to have states. And then it's, it's harder to introspect and understand what's going on. So my goal is always to come up with a nice set of functions that describe my, my application logic, which is my scientific logic or my, my data analysis logic. OK. Once these functions stabilize, I move them to a module. As developers, you know that modules are crucial, but scientists tend to not use them enough. And the reason they're crucial is that they enable sharing uh, code between experiments. They're also crucial because they enable testing. And as I go, I start developing very simple tests. <clears throat> and last but not least, it's crucial to delete code, right, and files. And the reason if you, if you don't do this, then you just end up with a complete mess and you don't know where things are. Do you know uh, where's Wally? You all know where's Wally. So there is a guy somewhere in there, and I have no idea where, who's uh, dressed uh, with a blue t-shirt and stripes and a red pant, and uh, he's called Wally, and you need to find him. Why can't you find him? Because there are so many people in there. If he was alone, you could find him. It's the same thing with my, my folder with my code in it. So uh, it requires a leap of faith to believe that, that we understand version control and just delete things all the time. So why is this hard? Why are scientists not doing this? Because, because they're stupid, right? No, not because they're stupid. The thing is that we have long compute times, and that's by construction, because if we don't have long compute times, if we do things that are more complicated, and then we have long compute times. And this makes us very unadventurous, because we don't want to touch something, because, oh my god, I'm going to have to rerun this, and then it's going to break. Uh, so that's a real problem. That's, that's not because scientists are stupid. Uh, also, um, I find that, uh, and I guess it's not your problem, but I find that quite often they don't know enough good editors and good version control. So it's always a question of knowing well your tool. Now, to address long compute time, one thing that I've been doing is to use the memoize pattern, which is a bit of a trivial uh, a textbook pattern. It's just that we have an implementation that is uh, good to work with really big data and that stores things to disk. So it's, it's in Joblib and it's, uh, it's a bit of a lifesaver, although it's not perfect. Uh, and the reason it is a bit of a lifesaver is it really fits in the experimentation loop where we just, you know, we keep mucking with things around, but we are not recomputing things that we don't need to recompute. Now, the, the bad news is it's very black boxy uh, because you, you, the persistence, you know, it's a, it's a modified pickle version, so uh, uh, there's no idea you know what's going on in there. So, okay. So, code quality is important. Knowing the tools is important. So, we need to use software engineering best practices. Uh, and... Scientists don't use them as much as they, they should, probably. And partly it's because they don't know them, but, but partly it's because not everything is suited for every single problem. And so let me, I have what I call the ladder of code quality, which is that you've got an increasing set of steps that go from costless steps, like using 
a good editor. Well, it's not completely costless to use a good editor because it needs it means you need to move aw away from the editor you know most, which is probably Microsoft Word. So it's it's a bit difficult. I'm not kidding. I've seen people coding in Microsoft Word. I mean, to give you background, I work with people who are medical doctors, who are psychologists, and this is not to say that medical doctors cannot code well. Some of them code fantastically well. But they've certainly not been trained to do this. And you'd be amazed by what they can do after a little while. And that's also thanks to Python, by the way. Uh, so using PyFlex or some form of linter is free if you have an editor that en enables this. It's free. Everybody should be doing this. Coding conventions and good naming is actually pretty free. You just learn it and then you're done. Version control is very, very costless. Oh, if you want to, to be a good citizen, you can try to um, uh, teach version control to, to people. There's this thing that's called software carpentry where uh, they're looking for trainers to teach these uh, things to people who don't know them. A code review is slightly more expensive. It is more expensive, it takes time. Uh, but, of course, it has a huge impact on the quality of code. Unit testing? Well, we all know that if it's not tested, it's broken, right? And that's really true. Uh, so now the question is, how much do you, do you, are you going to put unit testing? I, I always start with very little unit tests, and as my code consolidates, I add more and more to it. And, of course, making a package, which is what we would all want, that's definitely costly. But that's also what's going to make things really reproducible. So we have increasing cost. And it's really important in what we do, which is interactive, uh, iterative work, to avoid premature software engineering, to avoid immediately jumping to the last step of this ladder while the, we're still flushing out the IDs. Because if we do this, we're going to take a, a, an ID that's an immature ID and make it very solid from the software standpoint. But from the scientific or the data standpoint, it's not the right one. Okay? So there's this trade-off between over and under engineering, right? Because our goal is to generate insights and not code here. So if we go through all this, what do we get? We get a library, which is, I think, good. Libraries are what able, uh, enable you to build. They are what enable you to cross rivers. So it's, uh, it's uh, important to think about libraries and build libraries. This is how we we design our, our, um, our future. So I'd like to talk a bit about uh, how we build libraries and how we design libraries uh, for the, uh, the PyData or the SciPy uh, stack. Uh, and so this is how I, I think about API design for, uh, for this stack. And the first thing is to be a library. I, I've seen, I've done programs. By program, I mean something that controls the main or something that controls the event loop. And this is really evil. Because if you do this, uh, you cannot be blended with other things. And so, for instance, if you do machine learning library, or a machine learning program, and another guy does a, a brain imaging program, then I cannot do machine learning and brain imaging, which is my, my purpose in life. Uh, so be a library, because it enables science. Uh, as I've mentioned, functions in general are more reusable than classes, and uh, the reason is that the interface of a function is simpler than the interface of a class, and because it's stateless. So we favor, in general, of course, this is all in general, functions. When we do objects, I like to think about objects as something I can touch, and I'd like them to be shallow in the sense that I can understand them by touching them in very few places. So they need to have a simple interface, and by interface I mean the set of method, and uh, not too many attributes. And ideally they're not nested. Sometimes I have to, but ideally they're not nested. If I do this, it's really easy to take an object and understand what it, its purpose is and what it, its internal data representation is. In the objects, I'd like to special case the data containers. Uh, and that's what you know, comes in the functions and outside of the functions. It's how I exchange data around. And I think we should really stick to universal data containers. And I guess that's true also in general of general uh, Python computing. The good thing is that Python comes in with a lot of really good data structures. And 
there's often not always, it's often not a good idea to reinvent one. And what's not a, a data object is what I call an action object. And for me, it needs to be defined by its function. So in, in the code that I, I worked on for a long time that's been used by a lot of people, we have uh, things that are called engine and executor. Uh, it's a very general function, right? It's really hard to know what this thing does. So if we're not able to come up with a simple story, it's probably that we don't have a good function for our object. But this is how I think about, about design. Of course, we want to build on solid foundations, which means that we need to split uh, the different libraries uh, apart so that they each have a specific function. So I could have 3D plotting on one side and statistics on the other, and I could put this together to do 3D uh, imaging of brains. And then the second thing that's crucial once I've separated uh, things well is testing, as I, as I mentioned. So testing is crucial because it, it establishes correctness, but also because it enables refactoring. And this is what's going to avoid basically the library to collapse in, in the long run. So in, in scikit-learn, so what, what scikit-learn is, uh, it, it's, it's, a numerical, it's a set of numerical routines that deal with statistics, right? statistical data. Uh, and so when we started well, we had a lot to learn on how do you test these things. And so what we've learned is it's really important to test basic mathematical properties. So it's really important to have an understanding of what's going on. Uh, uh, so we, for instance, what we don't like to do is to hard code value the program ran like this today and to come back two years later and check if the value are the same. That's a really bad test because where's the threshold on numerical instability? Uh, if something is wrong, was the original value wrong or not? So, testing basic mathematical properties. We've learned that tests should run very fast. Tests that are slow, people don't run them. Uh, we've learned to make everything perfectly reproducible, like as much as possible. And so one thing, for instance, that is a source of irreproducibility is using the global uh, random number generator, whether it's the NumPy one or the Python one. Because, so the, the random number generator is, you know, is, is something that gives um, a stream of pseudo-random numbers. And if I, 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 I've got this, this global uh, stream, and if I grab some uh, numbers from it, then I've changed the global stream. And the, the guy that follows is going to grab different numbers. So then the uh, order of the test means that uh, they're seeing different random numbers. So it means that I can have random failures because uh, if the tests fail with in a certain order, but not in another. So in a sense, it's a good thing, because tests should be robust to this. So that's what we thought in the beginning. But uh, experience shows that it's a really bad thing, because then you get crashes that happen once in 10,000, and you can't reproduce them. Okay? So we've learned to be so picky that none of our functions can have... Well, th there is a mode in which none of our functions have a side effect. And part of the side effects are drawing random numbers. Our functions are purely functional because we can test them. We also have objects which are not purely functional. Another really, really nice thing that, that uh, came up in, in scikit-learn and that was mostly pioneered by uh, Andy Miller, who is the current maintainer, uh, is that we use what we call auto-tests to test interfaces. So in scikit-learn, we have a very strict interface specification. There's one object that we call the estimator, and it needs to buy the specific interface. And so, of course, the, 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 like the standard object-oriented programming way of doing this would be to say, I'm going to, whatever, type the thing, and then I'm going to have a type checker that checks that whoever inherits from my base estimator class needs to implement this. And it becomes... A, well, first, it, it creates a lot of coupling based on inheritance, and I personally don't like this at all, and we could discuss this offline. Uh, but also, it's really hard to test things like, in my contract, one, part of the contract is if I give you horrible data, you raise a specific error. That's part of the contract. How do I test, how do I enforce this contract by typing? Well, there might be languages that can do this, but I don't know how to do this in Python. 
So what we have is that we have a specific battery of tests that take an estimator and runs things on it. You know, inject junk data, check that there, are in, uh, that there is the right uh, interface by running it, uh, uh, try it with multiple data types, uh, try to run it twice on, this, on the same data and check that it gives the same result. Uh, and by doing this, it's made the code so much more robust because it really forces this, this estimator class of object to be really usable as a black box. You know, I can plug it somewhere and I have expectancies on it and they should be satisfied. I think that's a really interesting thing that came out. And finally, of course, we had a test each time we, we hit it back. That's fairly, fairly standard. All right, that's all I had for, <coughs> for library design. I could talk more about this. Uh, and if we want you know, to think about library design, I guess some things are common with, with general development and some things are not. And now I guess I'd like to talk a bit about machine learning in Python and specifically about scikit-learn, which is both an illustration of, of what I've been talking before and also maybe something that you can take home and, and use if you're not already using it. So my stack for data science, well, Python, of course. Why? Am I going to get a coffee? No? Okay, why, why do I use Python? Uh, well, I guess the, the real reason is because it's a general purpose language. Because we're in a room with people who come with very different backgrounds, who do very different things, and we're talking about the same language. And that's super useful because machine learning is going to be useful. I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be useful for almost every single one of your application domains. It's going to be useful for system administration. It's useful for, for security, for instance. It's, it's used to detect uh, attacks that are unusual. It's going to be 10 minutes. It's going to be uh, useful for what, what, what are people doing? Whatever, it's going to be useful for you. And that, that's why I came to this, because what you guys are doing is also useful for me. So together we can tackle a problem that's a, a wider problem than just a numerical one. And so, for instance, I use text mining in cognitive neuroscience because I want to understand the text. Then I'm definitely using things that have not originally been written by the scientific community. So, there's also a fantastic uh, scientific Python stack. Uh, and the core object, really, is the NumPy array. And if you guys don't know what a NumPy array is, you can just think of it as an abstraction over... Uh, uh, a float store store in C. So basically, it's, it's, it's an elaborate pointer. That's all it is, which is great because it's universal. We can all agree that, that we can use it. Uh, and, when, and across languages, I can hop from C to Python to C++ with NumPy arrays. So this is what I build upon. And then the other thing is that there isn't only scikit-learn in the SciPy stack. There are many other packages that I connect to and that is really the richness and the power of our stack. Now, machine learning, quickly. Machine learning is about making predictions from data. And for instance, I may want to distinguish apples from oranges. So I'm going to look at apples and look at oranges, and I'm going to come up with a decision rule, which is say that oranges are oranges and apples are green. And then I get new data, and it fails. Because prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. The challenge, Niels Bohr said this, so it's clever. The challenge is to learn as much as possible about the data, but not too much. And here, clearly, I had learned a bit too much, which is that the um, uh, apples were green. It's not something that generalizes us. So that's the core challenge of machine learning. Let me give you another example, more mathematical. Which of the two models do you prefer? The straight line or the wiggly line? Who goes for the wiggly line? Who goes for the straight line? Why? It is pretty prediction. But it doesn't fit the data as well, right? The error is huge. I mean, you can see. But if I acquire new data, maybe it's going to fit the new data better. That's the intuition. It's the intuition that we have, and it's the challenge of machine learning. And, and the, the message here is that there's a difference between minimizing the train error, so minimizing the error on the data that you've seen, and generalizing, okay? If I fully minimize the error on the data that I've seen, I don't generalize. This is known as overfit, it's the core notion of machine learning. And just like 
uh, apples being green. <clears throat> and so then what we need to do is to adapt model complexity to the data. So here I've, I've shown you a bunch of different lines that correspond in a trade-off between simpler models for a certain definition of simple and fitting the data. And finding this right trade-off is going to give me the model that generalizes best. And this is known as regularization in machine learning. So overfit, regularization, two core concepts of machine learning. And now let's speak about, let's talk about scikit-learn, which is a machine learning toolbox. And one of its goals is to be usable by non-experts. It's something that's fairly important. And by non-expert, I don't mean we're going to make the thing trivial, because it's not possible. I mean we're going to try to remove the, the technical barriers that you shouldn't have. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, it's a library, it's not a program, because it's more expressive and flexible than a program. You can use it in your own code in Python, uh, but it also means that it's, you know, the workflow is not complete. You know, I can't open the thing, drag and drop my Excel spreadsheet in it and analyze it. It's not our purpose. <clears throat> so the API is very simple. As I mentioned, there is basically one type of object, which we call the estimator, and there, there are subclasses, but the general ID is that you have an estimator and you instantiate it, and then you call the fit method, and you give it data to it. And when you give it data, you give it raw data and things to predict. So for instance, uh, if I'm trying to predict uh, apples or oranges, I'm going to give description, like the picture of the, of the apple or orange. And here I'm going to give a label that tells me this is an apple, this is an orange. Okay? And then I come up with new data, so new pictures. And predict is going to return a description, apple or orange. If you know this, you pretty much know scikit-learn. Well, not exactly, but mostly. Now, how's the data represented? NumPy matrices. So NumPy matrix, where I have in one direction the samples, so five minutes. In one direction the samples, so uh, each apple or orange. And the other direction, the feature, which is the numerical descriptor that I'm using, a set of numerical descriptors that I'm using to describe my data. Uh, how do I fit this into, say, text documents? Because text documents are not numbers. Well, this is known as vectorizing. And the idea being that, for instance, you can take your whole database of documents and then look at the vocabulary, look at what words are used in the database, and then you build a, a vocabulary, which is the list of all the words that are used. And then for each document, you count how many times a word is used. And it does get a bit more subtle. I mean, we do things like um, uh, normalizing uh, uh, the distribution because some words are more frequent than others and everything. But that's the idea how you go from something that's non-numerical to something that's numerical. Now, I'm, I'm running out of time, which is not surprising. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch a few words about, about some fancy things, or more or less fancy, in, uh, in scikit-learn. The first thing is you've all heard about big data. It's, it's the new black. Uh, and one thing that we need to, one difference that we need to make is whether it's big because we have many, many, many samples, so we've seen a lot of apples and oranges, which then is, is I guess it makes things easier from the statistical standpoint to see many things, harder from the computational standpoint because they stop fitting in memory, or whether it's big because there are many, many features. And that's the kind of problems that you get, say, in, in medicine because you, it's hard to see many, many, many patients, so you describe them very well. It actually makes the problem harder because then you've got many descriptions and you don't know where the information is. So to tackle the first problem, which is many, many samples, uh, so the, the way people tend to do it is they try to load everything in memory and then it doesn't load and then they say, yeah, it doesn't work. So the one way to do it, which works really well, is to do what's known as online algorithm, is that you do partial fits on chunks of the data, okay? I'm just giving you the keywords in, in, in case you need to come back. 
And we've got a bunch of different models that implement online algorithm. If you have many, many features, then you use a trick which is to basically reduce the data in a clever way as it's loaded. And you can combine the two, by the way. And there are different ways of doing this, and I'm going to speed through this. I said I would talk a bit about the more, some new gems in scikit-learn, but if you're not data scientist, all I can tell you is we're going faster, and we're going faster. Oh, and we also have outlier detection, which means that you can, have, you can find anom anomalies. So I'm, I'm running out of time. I need to wrap up. I've talked a lot about code, but I strongly believe, my experience has strongly shown me, that many problems are better solved by better documentation than new code. I think that's, that's really crucial. Uh, so if you're interested in the numerical, uh, the SciPy stack, we've been running this set of, of uh, uh, lectures online, so text, right, we don't have videos, to teach people numerics in Python. Uh, so it's, it's a big project, I guess. <clears throat> it's, it starts from you know nothing to you're a complete expert. Uh, one thing that's crucial in it is that it's based on a lot of code examples and mostly all the projects that I work in are based on code examples. And so if, if you're interested, we've got this, this thing that's called Sphinx Gallery that makes a gallery of code examples. Uh, it's really useful to get a, a good API. And for me, it loops back to uh, uh, library design. If your examples look good, your API is good. If your examples look bad, you need to rethink your API. Okay, to wrap up, the way I think about writing code for, for science and data, well, the first and most important thing is you need to go fast, which means that you need to experiment and tinker. So, and that also requires you knowing your tool really well, so there's some form of agility and some form of not adopting engineering practices too early, but not forgetting about them. You need to go far, and that's where code quality is crucial. And then you need to think about components that you can reuse and about quality and testing. And finally, for me, I think it's really important to facilitate so that other people can use it. That's worrying about API, docs, and examples. And I think one, one, one example of the outcome is scikit-learn. And we like to think of it as machine learning without, without learning the machinery. With this, uh, thank you. Thank you, Gael, for this fantastic keynote. Um, can I ask Radomi to get ready up here? And we might have time for one or two questions. Are there any questions? Raise your hand. We have microphones over there. I just didn't get, uh, I found it very interesting what you said about uh, like designing a library. And I got most points, but uh, the first point you said, be a library, and I didn't get what that means. Can you explain that again, please? Don't be a program. Don't own the main. Don't be a framework. Uh, I, I think that 90% of the code should be written, and maybe 99% maybe of the code should be written as something that's a bunch of functions and objects that are made to be used in a, in a, in a wider thing. And I see many people... Uh, uh, who think that it's easier for them to solve the problem by uh, owning the main and telling people uh, uh, you're going to uh, write your, your, your code like this and I'm going to call your code. And I can't do science if you do this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Where is our next speaker? Ah, all right. Is there another question? Anybody? All right. So uh, you talked about uh, these different stages of development where first you do some interactive work and then you move to a library and mm -hmm. probably you will also change the tools. So in the beginning, maybe Jupyter Notebook and then uh, later on you might uh, move to an IDE or a code editor. What I have found is that there is a kind of disconnect when you do this step. step. And once you want to go back and do some more exploration or so, you have two versions of the code, the interactive mm. script-like part mm. and the one you have in the library. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on how to uh, solve this problem? Yeah, I have no love for the Jupyter Notebook because of that. I don't use it. And the way I work is I always work in my editor 
and I may have a script and a module, and I'm jumping between the two, but uh, I'm, I'm always in the same environment. And, and interestingly, so, and it's, of course, it's a bit of a geeky way, uh, and, and non-geeks don't do this, but interestingly, uh, Atom uh, has gotten a plugin, Oxygen, I think, or Hydrogen, maybe, which allows you, so the Atom editor, which allows you to, edit, to execute blocks of code inside the editor. So it's kind of a blend between the Jupyter Notebook and an editor. And I personally think it's really the future. And the people in my lab, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm getting old because I use VI, but the people in my lab, uh, uh, they use Atom and they use this and they, they seem really happy. That's my thought. All right, let's thank Kyle one more time. <laughs>